ready to sing of the mercies of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. We're going to uh, take just a moment to pray and uh, officially invite the Lord to be with us this morning, although he was here well before we were. Let's bow our heads together this morning. Father, we are so thankful that truly you do prepare the way. You prepare the way in the sanctuary for us to gather and to worship together. You, thank, uh, you, you make us uh, realize how thankful we should be, Lord, as we get up and we look out at the mercies of each new day that you give us. We are thankful. Now we just ask that you would be with us, that you would fill this place, and Holy Spirit, you would have your way in each and every heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Stand up this morning, would you? And uh, we're going to start off with, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. She had a very important birthday, and her husband put that age out for everybody to see. And I remember what a big deal it was. But Gloria, it is so nice to have you with us this morning. And for all of you that are back that we haven't seen for a while due to, uh, due to some uh, issues in your life, we are so glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. But above and beyond all that, the reason that we gather to worship is because we serve a great, great God. Is that not true? That is true. Amen. This next song, I know we sing it, I want to say often, but it's been a while, How Great Thou Art. Just a beautiful hymn that expresses um, how we feel about, about God. 
and, uh, and how, when we consider, you know, if we just consider the bad things in the world, that this might lose, lose its, its uh, glamour and its luster, but it shouldn't. We should look around and consider our world and understand what a great God it was that put all this in play and who keeps it in play and keeps it going. The second, uh, the second verse talks about Christ and, and the sacrifice that uh, he gave. And I'd like you to be thinking about that this morning as you realize how blessed you really are to stand forgiven. Let's sing this morning. some announcements. Most of them, you know, have remained the same, but some of them have expanded. We still have our Tuesday night uh, study of C.S. Lewis screw tape letters. We did meet last week. We kind of didn't really touch the letter because we went over some, um, some discussion and some points about prayer, which the letter addresses. And so uh, we would love to have you join us um, on Tuesday night at 6.30 over at Casey Hall. The study of this book is very eye-opening and uh, it's a great... Um, spiritual formation book because it does help us form up more of our theology in what we believe about God and, and how he can overcome the enemy no matter what the circumstance. So if you want to join us, we'd love to have you Wednesday night prayer meeting as always at 630 here at the church. Let, uh, shoebox ministry, please, uh, please bring some stuff in and put it in the foyer. I know MJ loves to come in and see something new out there on the table every, every week and she, uh, she's doing such a great job. The downstairs isn't in the best condition, but you know, if you go by the room, she's got all the stuff and it's nice and neat. It says Merry Christmas on the door and it's really cool. So uh, as you get a chance, buy some stuff for those kids that uh, need that in order to enjoy Christmas this year and to get the message of Jesus out to people that perhaps have never heard. Uh, board meeting did not happen last week. We had so many people that were not gonna be able to make it that we will have it this week. 
at 6.30. I'm not sure whether we're going to have it over here in the wing or over in Casey Hall, but show up on the grounds and you'll figure it out. So board members, come on out at 6.30. Uh, the registration for the um, Ladies' District Day is up online, so this information in the bulletin of how you can find that. If you don't have access, please just give me the information that the bulletin asks for, and I will register you. We do have, a, um, we do have uh, money in our ladies' fund, so our ladies' fund here at the church is going to go ahead and cover the $10 admission for each of us that go. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come forward this, this morning as we prepare. Hopefully our hearts and our, and our pocketbooks are already prepared for this time of worship and our service. God is so genuine, and he is so genuine, generous, and he is so good to us in every aspect of our lives that uh, the little bit he calls back for should be just a blessing to give. And then uh, beyond that, whatever you give, God will bless that even more. So let's um, go to him. I'm going to ask Bruce Libby if he'd pray over our offering this morning, and I'm going to ask you to have joyful hearts as you would give. Father God, thank you so much for being able to come here and worship with you today. And whatever we give today, please use this uh, for whatever you uh, see fit. And uh, we thank you for these offerings. Uh, and thank you for this day. Lord. Like I said, we ask you to do this thing. Amen. chorus to listen to three times in the same day and not sing. Um, how many of you know the words well enough because I don't have them up there? How many of you know, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. That's pretty much it. No, there's a little more, but let's just sing it. Nance, 310, all over again. You're doing awesome back there. Jimmy and Justina are preaching in Norway this morning. Larry and Nancy are in the booth filling in. Um, and we are so thankful. But let's sing this together. If you know it, sing it loud, because not everybody does. And I hope I do. <laughs> Sorry for throwing you that curveball, Nance. This chorus is right out of scripture. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Isn't that right? Sing. Oops, not that one. <laughs> That's a good one, though. Nancy will thank Ann for this later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I probably should have done that. It's done. Now it's done. Okay. <laughs> I could tell if I had a joke. I could. I know. I know plenty. <laughs> All right. Why doesn't a pirate wash or take a bath before he goes, uh, before he walks the plank? Why? Because he'll just wash up on shore later. <laughs>
The next couple of songs that we're going to sing leading up to our prayer time are, are just really good reminders that God knows who we are. Um, I guess if you make somebody, you probably know who they are, right? And I guess you probably know every, each, each and every part of them, each and every thing about them. And that is who our God is. He made you. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, you were in his heart, and you can count on the fact that he knows exactly where you are this morning. He knows where you'll be tomorrow and where you were yesterday. Amen. He knows your name. I am going to ask that you stand and sing this, and then we will uh, sing one more before prayer time. But as you, as you sing this song, would you just contemplate deeply within yourself how special you are? Not your neighbor, although they are. Not your spouse, not your kids, you. How special you are to him. Because certainly as someone is praying up here for us all and lifting the general prayer requests of our church and of our hearts, you are the only one who knows the secret wants and needs and, and those prayers that need to go up to him that only you know in your heart. So as we go to prayer time, prepare your heart. And then as we are praying corporately, I would encourage you to pray silently to God out of the goodness of his love for you and out of the need of your heart so that it's personalized. We're gonna sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus, which is exactly what we're gonna do. Altars are always open. You certainly are welcome to bring those prayer requests here and kneel before 
him as we, as we sing this song, but let's look to him this morning for the answers that we so desperately need. Father, we thank you for our family and the parts and pieces that make up our family. And we ask you, Lord, to be with us today as we would come and uh, set the week down. We prayed this at the, uh, at the prayer circle this morning as we began to prepare to practice for our songs. We asked you, Lord, to take the week, and we intentionally want you to unwrap it from our lives. You can just leave that going, Nance. Don't worry about it. We want you to unwrap this from our lives, Father. To remove the weak, all the parts and pieces, and even if it's legitimate things, Father, we ask you to help us to take it off today and just stand before you as a, a clean white sheet of paper, giving you permission to write on that paper whatever you want. Yes. So, Father, we set down the week today, right now. Before we break the bread, we set down the week. And we ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and minds to receive a new thing. Let us reflect on all you've given us, Father, through Calvary. Yes. And through that, Father, all the wonderful life and life more abundantly that we have. And Lord, if there's something in the way, if we are causing that life abundant to stop mm -hmm. from our actions, we pray, Father, you'd be with us today and help us release that into your hands because you want us to come home. Mm -hmm. So Father, we thank you for all you're doing here. And we pray for all those that have come to the front, Father, and all those requests that are in the seats. I ask you, Lord, to please be with them today to watch over these things. And as always, we say, as thy will be done. So, Father, answer them, Lord, as you see fit. And we've got some heavy things we're carrying, Lord. Loved ones have passed away. And loved ones are on the edge of passing away. And, but, Father, we have to give them to you right now and say, thy will be done in the midst of all of it. So Father, we thank you for loving us the way you do. We thank you for this wonderful time of uh, praise and worship where we reached up and touched your face this morning. So be with us, Lord, we pray, and give us open hearts and minds to receive the broken bread. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. You can uh, turn down all the other mics, Nance, except for this one.
We'll be looking this morning at the book of Hebrews. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, Hebrews 10. You can turn there in your Bibles. And as my wife said, there's several things on the bulletin you need to be aware of. Also on the bulletin was a handout. And uh, we, we will be building a list. I, I gave you a handout last week for a different sermon. But over the next few weeks, we will be uh, building a list. And these are part of that list that we'll be working on. So the, the handout you have, and it's good to come away with a new awareness, a new knowledge of what the words mean that we study in English, the Greek translations. Well, we, we, we will be looking at Hebrews 10 in a moment. This is Hebrews 10.25. And do not forsake the gathering together, the assembling of yourselves, as is the manner of some. How many here have ever had a family gathering? Raise your hand if you've had a family gathering. Yeah. All of us, many of us, raised our hands. And this is important. This is the assembling together because at these family gatherings, there's a lot of power. They can, and they most always do, change the dynamic of that family. Just today, in this gathering of family, the dynamic of who we are to one another has changed. Now, I'm not talking about the change of drama that can take place in these gatherings of family. There's always that one person, that one drama queen or drama, queen, drama king that has to feed off the emotions of everybody else by dropping their drama on everybody. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how when we gather as family, we, we can begin to really see one another. I want you to look around this morning at the folks that are sitting around you, behind, back, beside, and look at them and really ask the Lord to let you see them. You see, the love and regard that we have when we see them, it begins to stir. It opens our eyes to that person and what they may be going through. And in the family gathering, it's especially so with little guys and little gals running around. Isn't it amazing what children can do? They bring down the walls of all the different things that might be in the way. But just being together, being in the assembly in the same room with family allows us to consider one another. As we spend time together in that gathering, conversations begin. And we share where we've been and what we've been up to. We make new connections because maybe somebody has gotten married and maybe somebody has a new baby. We find some help that we might need with a job or a home. Maybe there's been a loss and we, we receive sympathy or we give sympathy. Maybe there's some really happy moments that we have to celebrate. And then when it's all said and done, and this is an important part, we sit together and we share a meal. <laughs> Did you know there's nothing more intimate than sharing a meal together? Amen. That's a true statement. Okay. We have a fellowship dinner. Do we need a fellowship dinner here at church? Yes. Yes, yes we do. We're going to have a fish fry in a couple of weeks. A fish fry. Now, me and Larry have been working overtime collecting fish. We've got 300 <laughs> fillets. We're going to fry them up with this awesome, crunchy batter. So, we're going to have a fish fry on the kids' Sunday in a couple of weeks. We'll let you know what's happening. But dining together reaches beyond the point of just standing around and talking. It makes us vulnerable to the person sitting next to us or across from us. Assembling or gathering as family is life-changing. Here in this opening verse, the writer of Hebrews, and I'm going to say Paul a thousand times, so just get used to it. Paul begins with what the sermon is going to be about. He's teaching us today to not forsake. And in, in this day and age of all this silliness, and I know it's serious, and I know some folks have been really sick, so I'm not taking it lightly, but there are some folks that are just plain hiding. In this day and age, he's saying, don't forsake the assembling together of the church family. That's right. He's going to teach us to gather, and this is the reason. Gather to consider, exhort, and provoke one another into good works. We'll look at these words, but before we do, uh, I want to see what it is that draws us together in this assembling at church. Let me ask you a question. You can answer this. Why are you here today? <laughs> Somebody say why you're here. I love the Lord. You love the Lord. Okay. I look forward to doing my family every Sunday and getting a good sermon. Well, Angie, you have such good answers. She wants to be with her family and hear the sermon. What's another reason you came today? To hear God's word, wonderful. Amen. How about to sing the music, to shake some hands, to hug some people? Amen. That's family gathering, isn't it? That's family gathering. It's all part and parcel. This assembling together at church is important. It's not just another party. 
After all, if you live in a big family like I grew up in, we had a birthday party. It seemed like every month we had a birthday party to go to. It's more than the gathering together of people who just stand around for an hour and then begin to dribble away with apologies of, I need to stop at Walmart and pick something up. No, you don't. You knew this was coming two months ago. You had all week to stop at Walmart. Don't leave to stop at Walmart. Say amen. <laughs> it's far greater than any of that. And as important as those times are, birthdays and so forth, what Paul's going to ask of us today and in the next couple of weeks is filled with the love of God. It's filled with understanding of the redemption through Jesus Christ. These moments of assembling as church family are filled with growth and maturity. And those are key words, growth and maturity. They're filled with encouragement and discipleship. They're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that can, if we allow it to, lead us well beyond the humdrum Christianity that so many of us live in. These assemblings can change us in the name of Jesus. As they change us in the name of Jesus, and this is important, we can become powerhouses of witness for the Lord. If we'll only gather together. And as we gather, would we consider, provoke, and exhort one another. If you can, would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning, please? Hebrews 10, beginning at 19. Therefore, brothers, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil, an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day, capital D, approaching. Father, we thank you for your word, and again, we ask, Lord, that we could set down the weak. We have to stay in the world. Jesus said, uh, leave them in the world in John 17. Don't take them out of the cosmos. Leave them in the cosmos, Dad, but keep them as they are in the cosmos. So today, Father, we ask you to help us set down the things of the world. Yes. Let us unwrap them from our hearts intentionally. All the hoo-ha, all the foolishness. All the legitimate things. We take it off right now, set it at your feet, and say, what shalt thou have of me this day, Father? We love you, Lord, and we give you all this time in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This is uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Who, meaning Jesus, being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. Now, I want you to think about that. We just sang, he knows my name. This is, this is the son and the father. I used to love to hear you look just like your father when I was growing up. That's what he's talking about here. Who, meaning Jesus, being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person, God's, and upholding all things by the word of God's power, when he, Jesus, by himself, had purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Amen. Amen. That's right. Thank you, sister. Amen. Before we dive into what it means to gather as a body of believers... And consider, provoke, and exhort. That's, new, that's the King James Version. We're going to look at that. Before we look at those three words, I want to look at a few things as to why this book of Hebrews was written. It was, by its very title, written to the Hebrew believer. That's the title, Hebrews. It is for everyone, but it's for the, for the Hebrew believer specifically. And it applies to, as much today to the Hebrew believer as it did back then. These Christian Hebrews were working through uh, really hard to let go of some Old Testament traditions that were going on. <clears throat> they were struggling with uh, not doing some of the things that came from the mountain to Moses that had carried such weight in their lives. And the writer here is, is working at letting, getting them to understand and letting go of some of these things from the Old Testament. Into the Old Testament. He's telling them in verses 1 through 18 that they were indeed given by God. And they did exactly as God needed them to in their lives. But the writer also wants them to understand as much as they were from God, so is this new covenant about the Son of God. He wants them to see this in his writings. Let go of traditions. Do we find it hard sometimes to let go of traditions? It can be difficult, can it? We kind of expect things a certain way. Uh, we now have the bulletins back again. 
after 19 months of no bulletins. Uh, it, it, interesting, because my wife said the day before Dick said it, Dick Skillings brought it up. She goes, I'm going to start the bulletins again. And Dick said the very next day, we need to have the bulletins back. That's a tradition. Isn't it, isn't it nice to walk in and grab a bulletin? Amen. <laughs> we find it hard to let go of some of the bulletins and some of the traditions of our past. And it can be very hard. I've seen traditions divide churches about what type of music is sung during worship time. I've seen the placement of hymnals. Isn't that silly? Where the placement of hymnals should be in the sanctuary divided church. I've seen a plate of cupcakes divide a junior church. By calling us to assemble as God's men and women, the writer is trying to bring us into a group wherein, this is key, wherein the Holy Spirit can bring witness to our hearts and our souls together as family. Amen. That's what the assembly is all about. He's saying, get together, feel the Holy Spirit as a family. Mm -hmm. So the folks have traditions of the past, some of which were indeed life-altering. They're from God. And God has used the law sent down through Moses and one, to wonderful effect in their lives. And, but as Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to what? Fulfill, Fulfill the law. That's correct. So along with all these issues and traditions, and he's trying to get them to gain some spiritual traction in the ways in which they can be Christians under the new covenant. Now, along with this, these Christians were also being persecuted on all sides. I've said this many times over the past few months. The Hebrew Christians during this time, and especially in the Sermon on the Mount, those Christians were under severe persecution. And this is key that you understand this today. There were not many places where they could gather together freely and worship Jesus for all that he had done, all that he had given them. Not many places where they could gather. And Paul's telling them to gather. And because of this persecution, they had begun to stop gathering. Because of the persecution of social pressure and political pressure and the new laws that were being enacted about Christians, it was beginning to stop them from assembling and allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to fall on them as a group. Can we see the beginnings of this today in our day and age? It's just starting here in the U.S. We're beginning to see the efforts of the enemy. And I want you to listen to me today. This is why the assembling is so important. This is why he said it so, so emphatically. We're beginning to see it by the efforts of the enemy to take apart the gatherings and the assemblings of God's people. He's working overtime in the cosmos. And for those of you who don't, who don't know that, what that word means, cosmos means world. It means a way of living outside the will and the way of God. It means you have nothing to do with God. It is the world. In John 17, Jesus prayed, Lord, Father, leave them in the world. So that's the cosmos. And the enemy is trying to create foolish laws that would hinder if not stop the coming together as a church body. Now you might be saying that, right, Pastor? I'm telling you, it's the real thing. That's, we are so close to that right now. But the enemy has tried that in other countries too. Did you know in 1920s, he kicked all the Christians out of China? There were 96,000 Christians in China at that time. Do you know today, right now, at last count, there were 60 million Christians in China. Say amen. <laughs> Amen. 96,000 to 60 million. They're still gathering. They're still meeting under all that pressure. So what does the writer use to encourage us, encourage us as we gather? What are some of the things he's going to teach us about as we gather? Things about our Lord and God and our Savior that will cause us to hunger, hunger, to gather every chance we get. Do we? Do we hunger to gather and assemble in the name of our Father, in the name of our Savior. Are the things we know of Him, Jesus, and His Father, enough to create a burning desire inside of us to get closer to them? The love that they shared with us through salvation, has it caused us to want to love and grow within that relationship? How about, has it caused us to, to want to love and grow in the relationships of the person sitting beside you this morning? That's together. Or, has the cosmos so wrapped itself around our hearts, the spirits, that that takes priority over anything that God would bring into our hearts and minds? Has the cosmos, has the world, even very legitimate things, taken priority about what we may need to know about God and his people? So let's look and see what it is the writer teaches to bring us back into the assembling of God's 
men and women. See what he's going to teach us today. He says, therefore, this is 19, brothers, having the boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. Man, I could stop right there. We could sit here and talk about that set of verses for the next two years. Just that alone could be what we use to consider and to exhort and to provoke one another. Before we dig into that, I want, I want us to consider what I always say. What's the therefore? Therefore. Therefore. Beautiful. What's the therefore? Therefore. Therefore, brothers. Anytime you see the word therefore or wherefore, go back and read what you just read. He's saying look at verses 1 through 18. 1 through 18 is the therefore. Actually, all those chapters working up to this point, but specifically 1 through 18. And you'll see why the therefore is therefore. He's teaching us all that Jesus has done for them. He's, t- he's telling them about this, this old style of, of, uh, of insufficient animal sacrifices. That's not there anymore, but Jesus coming and dying was God's will as much as the animal sacrifices were God's will. And now through the perfect Lamb of God, Christ's death has made perfect the saving and sanctifying power that falls on whosoever will. Read God's word and see for yourself. 1 through 18. When was the last time we turned off the TV, put down the remote, got up from the computer, stopped playing games on your smartphone? Say amen. Come on. I know you're out there. (laughs) And really thought about what he's writing in verses 1 through 18. Aside from what we hear at this time of gathering for 30 or 40 minutes, when was it we deliberately sat down with God's word and realized the power and the impact of all that Christ has done for us. When was the last time we reflected on our salvation that we're going to heaven? Are you going to heaven today? Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to heaven. How about you? <laughs> yeah, jack it up a notch. I'm going to heaven. How about you? That's a powerful thought. We have been redeemed from our sins. Come on. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Man, when I think about that, it always, always stirs my heart. That second verse and how great thou art. And when I think that God is Son of the Spirit, sent him to die for me, it always, always stirs me. Salvation moments always stir me, especially when I think of my children and my grandchildren. I want them in heaven with me. I want my babies in glory with me. What spiritual condition are our loved ones in today? See, in order to answer that question, I I want to be the man that God calls me to be. So when my children look at my life, they're going to see a guy who's all in for Jesus. So when I stand before God, and ladies and gentlemen, you better believe this today, and he asked me what I did with those kids he trusted me with, I can say without shame the very best I could because I did it in your name. I'm not saying perfect, but I did the very best I could in his name. When was the last time we took the time to reflect on these things in verses 1 through 18? See, Paul's teaching us about these before we get into 19 through 25, so we can understand that we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to celebrate as an assembled fellowship of Jesus Christ. We have a lot to consider, provoke, and exhort each other with. Don't you love that word, provoke? My mom used to say, stop provoking your brothers. Don't provoke your brothers and sisters. But that's a good word in the Christian terminology. In the Greek, it means to sharpen. You ever sharpen an axe on a grindstone? What happens? Sparks fly everywhere. Material comes off. Superfluous junk. It's all rounded over. You want to make it sharp so we can use that tool in the name of Jesus. So when we provoke one another, we sharpen one another. And sparks are going to fly. And junk is going to come off. Would you stand still and allow me in the name of Jesus to provoke you? Hmm. Good preaching, Sam. Say amen. Come on. We have a lot to consider, provoke, and exhort each other with. However, we do know that if we want to receive Christian maturity and get back the new growth that we get when we invest in it, we have to invest in it. We get get back what we put in. We get back what we put in. 
Well, Pastor, you don't know how hard it is, my work day. I don't stop. You don't get it. Yeah, I do. Before I came here to Wyndham, I was co-pastoring a church. I was doing a New Star church. My honey was right beside me and all of this. And I was building houses full time. So you better believe I get it. But I was all in for Jesus. And I couldn't get away from verses 1 through 18. And it, they gave me the strength that I needed. I had to unwrap the things of the world around my spirit. I'm not talking about going out and getting into sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm speaking about things that are very legitimate in the world. Things that the world would offer me. Very legitimate things. But they take the place of the things that God would have for my life. That extra shift at work. Now I can't have that, son. That Sunday on the lake instead of going to church. Now I can't be there, son. Just watching TV with the kids. I would go upstairs and Ann, we had all of our kids living with us. What a time we had. Little Cape up in Monroe, Maine. We all came home together. And everybody lived in the same house. We had dogs, cats, rats, bats, children, everywhere. <laughs> but what fun we had in that house. And I'd go upstairs to do my studies. And I'd go up the stairs. I could look in the living room and see them all having fun. God said, no, come on, kid. I got things for you to learn. Very legitimate things. But God always replaced them with something better. Did I miss them? Did I pine for them? Yeah, I did. But he always, always replaced them. Because of those times, because of those studies, because of those sermons, my kids now are serving God full out. Many Christians today, they, they want to put in the minimum of spiritual growth, and they expect back the maximum. They show up here at church, these gatherings, these assemblies, and they haven't lived for the Lord not even one hour this week, yet they expect to walk out of here looking like Paul the Apostle. Not even one hour. Well, if they'd sing the right songs, if they'd sing the right worship music, I know I could grow with God in that one hour. If the preacher would preach on what I want to hear, I could really mature in 30 minutes. If that youth pastor would take my kids and my daughter and turn her around, I could grow in Jesus. Uh-huh. See, if we're going to be able to grow and receive the fullness of what Paul teaches, we have to begin today, right now. I don't want to hear any excuses right now to offer God the very best that we have. Because next week, this writer, in the next couple of weeks, this writer is going to expect, expect some things from us. Don't miss these next couple of sermons. He's going to expect some things from us. He, he's going to ask us to give and receive some things. And if we are not all in on Jesus, all in for God, we're either going to not do them or be offended if somebody comes up to us and brings them to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's that provoking thing. It's that sharpening thing. It's that spark thing. It's that get rid of that superfluous junk thing. If we haven't done what we should do, we're going to be offended. We're going to get our nose out of joint and walk out of church. See, the power of the Word of God changes us. It happens when we hear it and apply it to our lives. The Scripture says, Be ye not only hearers of the Word, but what? Doers. Doers. So if we've been here for 20 years and just sit here and listen and never apply what God's word says, and then God sends a man or a woman to us at the gathering, don't you love that when somebody comes up to you? God sends a person to you. Boy, this is real. You better believe this today. This is the real deal. When God's on somebody and he sends them to you, I'm not talking about Sister Fluffy Duffy or Brother Hardcase coming up and giving you a hard time. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when God sends somebody to you for real and it's falling away in the church and it breaks my heart because back in the day there used to be a guy that walked the sanctuary in the power of the Spirit and he'd watch for guys and gals that were struggling. And he'd go up to me, put his hand on their shoulder and say, can I pray with you? Can you imagine doing that today? One of these great big fancy churches, some guy in an old suit walking around saying, God's told me I need to pray with you. Boy, they'd, they'd run him out on a rail. But what are we going to do if you've been there for 20 years, you've never done nothing with all that you've learned, and all of a sudden God sends a man or woman up to you and says, you know, God's spoken to me. Could I pray with you? Well, we're either going to receive it if we're all in or we're going to get upset. Next week, before we look at these words, two weeks from now, consider, provoke, and exhort. I want you to look at the verses 1 through 18. I want you to take the time to study them. Maybe for the first time. I want you to sit down intentionally. Get out your dictionary. 
and look up some words, find out what 1 through 18 means. Find out just how powerful what Christ has done is for all mankind. Then as we gather, as we assemble, if you'll do this, I promise you, when we gather and assemble and I start talking, you're going to go, hey, I just read that this week. I know what pastor's talking about. Hey, did you hear that? Pastor just said something I read. And then we're going to want to share it with our loved ones. So we begin with the first thing on the list that we'll talk about as we gather to exhort and provoke and encourage. It says, therefore, brothers, we have boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus Christ. The first thing we receive as we come together today is to exhort and provoke one another is remembrance that we can now approach God in his throne room with boldness. Amen. If you look at your sheet, I've given you one, we've done an assembly one, but this is boldness. Boldness means that this is you in God. Boldness, outspokenness. I'm not talking about... Mouthy. Mouthy, yeah, thank you. That's my wife's term, mouthy. I'm not talking about that. I had a lady say, I'm just going to be honest with him. I said, stop. I said, you're not going to be honest with him. You're going to be frank with him. Frank is from you. That's from self. Honesty is from God. Honesty builds up even if it hurts. Frankness just tears down because it's from self. So he's talking about boldness. It means outspokenness, a public assurance, spoken plainly, a freedom of speech. And this is the one I want you to hang on to today. To be unreserved in speech with an absence of fear in the doing. That means you get up and you go to God in prayer in his throne room. Amen. 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 What an awesome way to begin to talk at this gathering of God's people. To talk about the boldness we have in prayer. That everyone who is redeemed can speak to God in this fashion. That we can boldly come to him in our prayer time and release whatever it is that's on our hearts. Now remember, we're building a list of things to talk about as we gather, a list of things to exhort, consider, and provoke each other with as we assemble. And the first on the list is that we have a freedom to come to God. Now, boldness, Paul's not speaking about some kind of arrogant, spoiled kid. He's not talking about someone who wants what they want, when they want it, exactly how they want it. It's not vending machine Jesus. Where we sit and do nothing for the Lord all year and then take two coins and pop them into the vending machine, Jesus, and pull the lever that we think we deserve. See, selfishness and acting like a spoiled brat has nothing to do with the heart and mind of one of God's kids. Because we know what it costs God. Amen? Amen? We know what it took to create this new covenant so that we may boldly approach so we come to him humbly and with respect in our hearts and love in our hearts. It cost him the life of his son. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, we now have that door open to go boldly. We begin, we've been given access to the Father because of the shed blood of Jesus. And we accepted that free gift of salvation. And now we love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, and with all of our strengths. That is a relationship because that's going on. We love God. We would never, ever approach him in any way but humble and with love. The second thing I want us to look at as we gather is what it took to do that. As we are assembled for praise and worship, I want to reflect on something that he mentions here. It's the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. Now, this can be one of the most powerful moments of growth in any assembling of God's people. We call it communion. It's holy communion. It's one of those things in the Old Testament that Paul was trying to, the writer, was trying to work them through. See, before Jesus died on the cross, and this is an important part of this message this morning. I want you to think about this because he's going to talk about what sin costs. Before Jesus died on the cross, uh, the people would have to bring the sacrifices of different kinds of animals. This is a sin offering to the high priest, and the high priest would offer them to God. Now think about this this morning. Thousands of animals for thousands of years had been sacrificed by the high priest so that the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. And present God with the last of the sacrifices, and God would either receive it and forgive the people of their sins or not. Thousands of animals, hundreds of thousands of animals for thousands of years. Picture that today. Hundreds of thousands of animals for thousands of years. Do we have even a small understanding of this? This is the power of sin. He says, flee from the very appearance of sin. That's why it's in there. This is the power of sin. Hundreds of thousands of animals, their blood flowing. 
This is what sin has done to the creation of God, humanity. It has such a hold on humankind that it took this much blood to wash it clean. Don't play around with sin. Amen. Flee from the very appearance of sin. See, God realized that this way had to be changed. It wasn't broad enough in its application. Many Gentiles were missing out on his love, so he sent down his son to offer once and for all the perfect sacrifice so that everybody who wanted to could have their sins washed away by the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so that we could go boldly before the throne. Sin has a stranglehold on the people of this cosmos. What an issue to talk about as we gather to exhort and consider and provoke. Have we reflected on the power of sin that surrounds us? Have we taken the time to reflect on the damage that sin does? Just one person can disrupt an entire family. It's, it, it, the damage is done on people we love, maybe even us. The writer of Hebrews is guiding us into deeper thought and deeper reflection as we gather to exhort and consider and provoke one another. He wants us to think about the cost and the power and the freedom that we can have over these sins. Sin is through the blood of Jesus, have we? And we actually thought about the freedom from sin that we have because of Jesus. And from this freedom, those have we thought about those around us who need it? This gift of being able to enter into God's throne room is for the genuine believer. The genuine believer. It's not for the person who, who's playing patty fingers with the things of God. It can't happen there. If you're not all in, if you're not forgiven, you can't approach God. Because His holiness would kill us. It's for the genuine believer. This boldness is for the genuine believer. This is what genuine means. I want you to think about your Christian walk today. This is what genuine means in genuine believer. Actually having the reputed or apparent qualities or the character of what's being spoken. Free from hypocrisy and pretense. To bring forth and produce what's being said. In other words, you're walking what you're talking and spiritual fruit is all over you in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, that's important. We need to produce spiritual fruit. Have we produced anything last year? What have we produced? You see, we need these great big red apples of testimony. And that person can come up and say, hey, what is that? I hope they don't say this. That's growing on you. Wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> what is it that's growing on you? We can have these big red spiritual apples of witness of Jesus Christ. And they can come up and say, hey, what is that? Say, hey, pick one. Go ahead and take one. It's the fruit of my life in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you about what that apple represents. What have we grown over the past few years? See, genuine means to have... Actually being seen, what's been reputed, is apparent in how we live. The high priest of the Old Testament, as he went into the Holy of Holies to present that final sacrifice, that final bowl or final laver of blood to God, that guy had to be perfect. He had to be perfect in his relationship with Jehovah. Zero room for sins or even physical blemishes. It was so strict that he would tie bells on the bottom of his robe and a rope around his leg. If the bell stopped, everybody would yank the rope and pull the pastor out from behind the curtain. As this high priest went in to stand before God, he had to strictly, strictly examine himself. Think about this. What do we look like when we enter the throne room? This guy couldn't have a blemish. He couldn't have made one mistake. What do we look like? As we go boldly into the throne room of God, what do we look like? What's our week been like? I know there are days when I'm a mess. There are times that I feel so unworthy to approach my Heavenly Father, who's forgiven me of my sins. This priest had to be perfect. What do we look like when we go to God in his throne room? This guy couldn't have a blemish. He couldn't have a mistake in his week. He had to be perfect. What do we look like when we approach boldly in this stone? Isn't God's grace awesome? <laughs> Isn't God's grace awesome? 
See, it's by the grace and love and the blood of Jesus Christ that I can go into the presence of my Father. God's grace. In the Greek, it's charis. It's where we get our word charisma. It means to be drawn in and partake of God's grace. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't that something that we can gather and exhort and provoke and consider as brothers and sisters? God's grace. Have you ever had one of those days when you just felt so lost and adrift? And suddenly, out of nowhere, God's grace falls on us. Mm. And we remember that we're his kid. See, we're building a list here, folks. We're going to gather these things around us, have them deep within our hearts, and then we're going to exhort and consider and provoke as we gather. You have this through, you have this, all that Paul's talked about, the writer has talked about, you have this through a new and living way, a way which he, Jesus, has consecrated for us. It's all done, that's what it means. It's consecrated, it's done. You ain't going to get any better than this. It's consecrated. Go through the door, stop yakking about it, take a chance, trust God, have some faith, and go through the door. Amen. He's done this through the veil which was his flesh. And again, what a topic for conversation. The new and living way, this is what living means. A quickening of our spirit and soul. Have you ever felt that when the Holy Spirit falls on you, all of a sudden your heart starts pounding? A quickening of our spirit and soul to live by and through the Son of Incarnation, meaning Jesus. A new way of living life. As we come to the Father in the Son, we found forgiveness, and now we have a new way of living life, and life more abundantly. Our spirits were quickened. We had our sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood. Back to the Old Testament. The sacrifices of the animals, as they were presented to the high priest, had to be alive. This is important. This is that word living. This is what it means. He's saying new living way. That word living, this is what it means. As they brought the animals to the high priest, they had to be alive. They could not be restrained. They could not be drugged to stay still. They had to be alive without blemish. They had to be pure, as we'll see in the King James. It says true. The blood had to be living and alive and fresh. As they were presented, the father of that family, dads, listen to me, the father of the family had to stand there with his hands on the animal as the priest would cut its throat. Dead. The blood had to pour fresh and clean out of that animal. Again, I, I, as I typed this out, I was astounded at the power of sin and the ultimate demands that it puts on us. Sin. It's like lying. You start lying and you've got to cover one lie with another. Pretty soon your whole life is a lie. This blood had to be fresh and clean. It says Jesus did this. A new living way through Jesus, which he consecrated for us. Living, fresh blood. Alive blood. That's the demand of sin. And the ultimate demand of sin is if we're not forgiven, we stand before God, it's going to be our eternities. And he says living way also, and he mentions the flesh of Jesus Christ being torn, the veil. It was actually the physical veil that was torn from top to bottom. It was a massive curtain, really, really thick and really, really tall. It was torn from top to bottom so that no man could claim he did it. But what the writer wants us to consider as we gather to exhort and provoke each other is the veil of the flesh of Jesus Christ. It was torn so that we could find forgiveness and reach God. So just in these few verses, just a couple of verses, there's so much for us to consider and provoke and exhort each other with. But we must be assembled to do so. We have to assemble, forsake ye not the gathering together of the brothers and the sisters, as is the manner of some, but do it all the more as the day, capital D, approaches. Once more, I want to encourage you to take your Bibles home this week and look at verses 1 through 18. Read them. And see just how they have affected our lives, if they have affected our lives. Study them and watch as maturity begins to blossom in your lives. You've got to ask the Holy Spirit, folks. That's how it works. You've got to ask Him. And He will give you what you need to fall in love with the Word of God. 
Somewhere, sometimes we've got to draw a line and say, that's enough. I'm all in. The legitimate things of the world will try to strangle you. They will wrap themselves around you. But somewhere at some time, you've got to say to God, I'm all in. I found it in 86, 1986. I was stationed up at Loring Air Force Base. And the pastor was so honest with me, he provoked me. Amen. Thank you, Stephen, Pastor Stephen Sinclair, for provoking me. He said, would we meet? Could we meet? And I said, yeah, you bet. And all of a sudden, the provoking started. And man, the sparks are flying everywhere. He said, you are full of beans. You're a mile wide and an inch deep. And I fell in love with God through that. We went to the altar that next Sunday, and I gave myself 100% to God by faith. There was no lightning bolts. I just went down by faith and said, God, would you give me more? And I got up that Monday, and I couldn't get enough of the Word of God. I'm serious. The Holy Spirit blessed me. Would you take that chance and look at verses 1 through 18 for these next two sermons? Because we're going to get to those three words. Not next week, but the week after. And we're going to talk about what they mean as we gather. Could you stand this morning with us? Nancy, yeah, so you can start CD number 7, if you would, please. I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus today. I don't know how much growth you've experienced in your walk. You can bring that way down, Nancy. Bring the CD way down. Thank you. I don't know how deep you are in your maturity and your growth with the Lord, but I invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads today. The altars are open. And it's one of the things that, again, it's one of those beautiful things that's fading away in the church. Many churches don't even have altars anymore. I will never have a church that does not have an altar. Never. These altars are open all the time. So I've got to ask you today, where are you with the Lord? Has the cosmos, has the world wrapped itself tightly around your spirit? I'm not talking about going out and getting into sin. I'm talking about legitimate things. Are we so concerned about the cosmos that we can't see the things of God anymore? How about his word? How much time do we spend in his word? Father, I want to lift my brothers and sisters to you this morning. I thank you, Lord, for them coming out, for them assembling at the gathering. But Lord, we want to consider, provoke, and exhort one another. It can only be done through you or through your spirit. For if we do these things in our own power, it's just going to cause misery. So Father, through your Holy Spirit, through your power, through your wisdom, we're asking to open our hearts and minds to the things of God. And Lord, as you move us and we gather, we could do these three things and we would grow. Lord, again, I thank you for the day that Pastor Steve provoked me. He ground off a lot of superfluous junk that didn't need to be there in my heart. You did. He, he just used him to do it. And because of that, Lord, I became a sharp instrument, instrument in your hands. Lord, let us all become sharp instruments in your hands today. Start right now. Lord, put us on the grindstone. Take off the junk that don't belong. Sharpen us up so that when you say, go and talk to that person, I don't care if it's our son, our daughter, our mom, our dad, whoever, we will go and say, because they'll be your words. So thank you again, Lord, for this Sunday. Thank you for the wonderful praise and worship music. Thank you for the broken bread. Thank you for the hugs and handshakes. Now be with us as we go out into our week and let us become the men and women you've called us to be. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Give, give five people a high five. <laughs> <laughs>